Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining EAC's webinar today. This is Addison Tyne. I am the marketing specialist here at EAC. We will be recording the session today. So pending any technical difficulties, everyone will receive a replay of the webinar. Please feel free to drop any questions in the queue and we will get to them after the presentation. Following the session today, um, we will be talking about some of the promotions. Um, so stick around for that. Today, I will start off with a short introduction of EAC and then our tech Technical account manager and Creo expert, Bill Schlund, will be diving into Creo um, additive manufacturing. At EAC, our mission is to transform the way companies design, manufacture, connect to, and service their products. We are located all over the United States, and our headquarters are currently established in Minneapolis. We are more than just a value-added reseller for PTC, though. We have been partnered with them for 20 year years now, with experts in 22 areas of product development. We offer our customers everything they need for product development, from CAD and simulation software for the full product design process, software for managing service documentation, and technology for managing product data. We also implement IoT and AR into business strategies to jumpstart initiatives around digital transformation, connecting all things in your company. We assist with design and engineering projects, offer webinars and PTC certified training courses for continued learning. We are also a commercial reseller for Form Labs, offering their latest products in 3D printing with packages starting as low as $34.99. All in all, we want you to know that EAC is a company you can partner with to get all the technology at the forefront of your business to help make your team successful. Now I'll hand things over to Bill so he can show us all about additive manufacturing in Creo. Thanks, Addison. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I am Bill Schlund, and we'll be going through, um, really it's a single feature inside of Creo Parametric, but it's uh, pretty far reaching and capable in what it does. Uh, and the whole purpose again is to uh, create the designs that we come up with using Creo Parametric and get them uh, manufactured quickly using 3D printing. So first question is, why uh, do we use a lattice structure in uh, a solid model? Why don't we just print out the solid model the way it is? And the reason being is that we want to print things out as quickly as possible and with as little material as possible. And one of the things we can do is replace solid material with what is called a lattice, but basically it's a structure uh, could be a honeycomb structure, as we see down here, uh, which is kind of a considered two and a half D. And this is sort of an evolution of how um, the integration of the lattice has gone in in Creo over the years. But started off in Creo four, we could do two and a half or three D lattices, a variety of different shapes. Uh, then in six, we started using um, some uh, formula driven and stochastic type lattices. And then in seven, we've kind of uh, changed in the mathematics that we could use in developing those lattices. And then also added in the ability to create your own lattice structure should none of these be acceptable to what you wanna do. So we'll kind of go through all of that as we go through this uh, presentation. I'm gonna do a little bit of PowerPoint, then I'll show you some things in Creo and kind of bounce back and forth. It's kind of typically how I do things. So first of all, um, when we're placing our product in the 3D printer, we want to think about the build direction. How is it oriented? And the thing is, is that when we do put something in a 3D printer, uh, a series of supports are created to hold that part up. Again, these supports will take up material and time to print those out, but they are needed in order to give us a good quality part. And the thing is, is what can we do to reduce the amount of support that we have to have for our particular product? So that's where we have. Uh, what we call the build direction. And that's gonna allow us to um, minimize the amount of support structures, but also look at it in a couple of different ways. So I'm gonna pop up Creo here just to show you that. It's a new uh, capability. Now here I have a, uh, a little kind of a side view mirror. Uh, we have a support arm here. And as you can see, we've actually taken the solid material and replaced it with kind of a, a honeycomb lattice here. But uh, basically what we wanna do is place this uh, in our 3D printer in an optimal position. 
And by the way it was built, you know, it's kind of built in an assembly, so it's not exactly, you know, along the X, Y, Z orientation, and that's that's fine with us. Uh, so what we want to do is this build direction is just under analysis, and it's just a button right here called build direction. And there's a couple different things that it will look at. First of all, it wants to know what, pick a plane that would represent basically the floor of the 3D printer. Um, so I, I'm going to pick this horizontal plane. I could pick any, I could make my own plane and choose that as well. Uh, what it does then is it takes a look at the part, the way that it's oriented now, and will highlight things in terms of um, critical angles and then subcritical angles. So basically the areas we see in red are areas that are going to be needing support, right? We'll have to build supports to hold that portion up. The areas in yellow is kind of the subcritical ones. Basically you might get by without making uh, supports there, but there is also a potential problem if you don't. Uh, so basically it's given us an idea of where the supports are going to go to kind of support this um, the way that it is oriented right now. So the whole idea about this is to allow us to manipulate this part in order to um, optimize um, or at least probably minimize the amount of supports we have, but also some other things. So let's take a look. There's three different things that it looks at here. It'll look at the downskin um, area. So basically that will minimize the amount of support structures. Um, then it can look at a shadow area. So what is the minimum uh, footprint that this would present in our 3D printer? And then we can look at it from a height restriction. What is the way I can orient it so that it takes up the least amount of height, maybe if that's a restriction in our printer. So what we can do is pick on ways. I'm gonna do the shadow one because that is kind of dramatic with this particular part. But um, um, if we say calculate this out, I'll just say, um, let's compute this. What it starts to do, and I'm looking at this, and I'm familiar enough with Creo to see that it's it's using the optimization capabilities that we have, not only in Creo Simulate, but also in behavioral modeling. So what it's doing is it's manipulating the part in space, spinning it around uh, in order to minimize the um, shadow that it would cast on that plane that I used as our uh, the base of our 3D printer. So it goes through this. It takes maybe like 10, 15 seconds uh, to do that. And when it's finished, um, here it's just going through the number of iterations. So it's going through quite a quite a number of iterations in order to manipulate the um, component in the tray. And when it's finished, uh, one of the things I can do is save that orientation, right? So I want to be able to save that because right now the way it was built, it just has this particular orientation. But we can say, okay, let's close this out now. So it's finished, and I can say close here. And now it orients our part. So as I said, this is our build tray floor. If we orient it this way, this casts the minimum shadow. If we were shining the light straight down on it, this would cast the minimum shadow. So you can see it's kind of tipped it on end. And again, we can still see uh, areas that are going to be needing support if it's oriented like this. But again, this would cast or leave us the minimum footprint on our uh, on our design here. And then one of the things I could do is I could click this button. I could save this view orientation, right? Call this like shadow orientation. And now I can go back to my model anytime I want and say oriented for this shadow or oriented for the downskin minimum support or down or oriented for the height. So I can run through these different scenarios to kind of orient my part to optimize its design. <clears throat> so that's um, kind of a new capability. Uh, fairly recent with uh, Creo Parametric, but again, it allows you to uh, orient your parts to optimize uh, certain characteristics that you might want to have while printing. So let's move on a little bit. Uh, this is kind of a subtlety. There's always things going on in the background with Creo Parametric, or in this case with uh, you know additive manufacturing, uh, where they did some timing tests between Creo 5 using you know creating these. Uh, Certain types of elements. Now I mentioned before that there are various types of lattices. Uh, these are a listing of the types that are are available. Um, <clears throat> so what we can do is take a look at the time improvements, and it's actually it's sort of like an order of magnitude times two that they've reduced the time to generate lattices. So it's a lot more efficient um, <clears throat> because we can tend to have a lot of lattice structure in parts. Um, so something to uh, to be aware of, but uh, it's just a lot faster than it used to be. 
Another thing that uh, it does, based on the build direction, remember how it oriented my part a certain way, so it knows which way is up and which way is down relative to the 3D printer. And one of the things it can do is something called lattice transitions. But what it does is it supports walls, or really the ceilings, of certain uh, areas of my part. So here it is without any transitions, but I can turn on transitions. And you notice any wall, or in this case, we kind of think of it as a ceiling, um, it builds more vertical supports in this area or vertical lattice structure in this area, I should say, not supports, but it increases the lattice structure to support this particular wall um, as this is being printed. So it's just a, a button you can click to increase um, maybe the, the density or the number of uh, beams in a particular lattice structure to support something. Again, you do need to know the build direction uh, as we just went through before, because then it knows up from down and it knows where to put, place these as opposed to, it could be any random direction. The next one is material homogenization. But basically, what it allows you to do is we can create these lattices, as we saw before, we can create 3D lattice structures. Um, there's a couple of different representations of, of these structures, and let's kind of take a look at those. So I'm gonna close out this one, and we'll take a look at our, uh, at our part here, and we'll turn off our planes. So in this particular case, let's go in and create a lattice structure for our part. So under engineering, here is that lattice feature. And again, I can come in here, and I'm gonna say, let's um, replace the whole part. So this whole body is gonna be used, um, fill this all in but I want to also put a shell around. So I do want a solid shell and not just lattice on the outside. And we'll give it a, we'll take the default wall thickness. And I'm gonna say remove the front and the back walls just so we can see what it's putting, what the lattice structure that it's putting in there because um, if I didn't, it would put it all on the inside. You'd have to do section cuts to see it. So basically I'm saying, you know, make a wall thickness around that and then everything else inside that volume, um, use this particular type of lattice and, uh, Maybe for this, I'm also going to say, let's use it kind of half scale. And I'll just say, let's um, let's preview that. So it's going to go out and generate the lattice structure. And then we'll be able to see it through here, um, through these open walls that I left. So we can kind of see how this is laid out. But this is creating 3D geometry, as you can see. So again, I could orient that particular uh, cell uh, any way that I want or just orient the part differently potentially, and it would place it in at different angles. But we can see that the this is the structure um, that it makes. And um, this is you know, referred to as the full geometry, right? So we're seeing all the beams and all the balls and even little fillets around those and all of that information is there. And so lots of information here. This can make the part uh, file size grow quite a bit. So, and it, you notice it took a little while to do that. Um, <clears throat> another way of doing this is I'll say instead of full geometry, let's use simplified geometry. So it's still going in the inside, it still knows what it looks like. But now when we say create this, it's able to create it much quicker because it's not having to build the exact geometry. It's really close representation visually for me and mathematically and, you know, from a B-Rep standpoint, it will be exact when it gets to the printer, but it's just allowing us to build it a little quicker. Now, the third way was the one that the last PowerPoint slide that I had, and that's homogeneous. And what that one does, we say turn that on, is really quick, right? And what it does is it just fills that volume with kind of a bluish area indicating to us that's the lattice that's in there. But the thing is, again, like the previous one, all that lattice information is there. You would use this if you wanted to do maybe some structural or thermal analysis using Creo Simulate. So what it does is it replaces that lattice that we saw with basically beams and nodes, which solve really, really quick. So instead of using a 3D element that has you know, a diameter and a length, and it's putting elements across all that, you'll end up with this, tons of elements. It'll take a long time to solve. This uses beams and nodes, uh, specifically element types that solve very quickly, but still give you the same results. So that's one of the reasons why you might want to use this if you're going to be doing some uh, analysis uh, 
like I said, either structure or thermal analysis on this particular part. So we'll cancel uh, out of that for now. Let's go back to our, our point here. The next thing I want to talk about is formula-driven lattices. So we saw, basically, I was just using a, a square lattice before, but there's, you know, a honeycomb. Well, yeah, let's go look at it just so we can kind of see the different ones that we have here. Uh, so I'll go over to our lattice again, and we'll do, yeah, I'm going to get this up, same thing. And we'll do a shell, and we'll remove the front face and the back face. So the different types of cells that we have available to us, you notice we're using beam type lattice types right now, but then the cell type, we could change it to, you know, a triangle, we could change it to a hex. Um, I could, this is the octagonal type of shape. And then this is a different type we're gonna talk about in a little bit called stochastic. But if we change it, let's say change it to a hex, and instead of um, creating it this way, you could say create it as two and a half D. So instead of an element or a lattice that looks with beams, it just creates a solid kind of a two and a half D representation. And then if I put that in, we'll see that it goes really quick, right? Because it's not having to create a lot of geometry. And again, I could scale the size of this uh, kind of a honeycomb representation here. But you can see there's a, a, a library of different types of elements that we can use for this. So that's kind of nice. Um, let's go back to regular beam stuff. So back to our PowerPoint here. So another one we have is formula-driven lattices. And the advantage of these are that they um, have high stiffness, right? So again, we want our part, our 3D part when we're printing it, and we're replacing all the solid material with a lattice structure. We want it to still be really, really strong. So this formula-driven type of lattice makes it very strong. <clears throat> it also keeps it lightweight, it prints faster, uses less material, all those good kind of things that you want to have happen. Um, because they're self-supporting type of a lattice structure, um, so they have um, very high stiffness um, and low von Mises stresses and things like that, things for uh, structural analysis. Uh, one of the things that it's good for is if you don't know what direction the forces might be um, in, exerted on your 3D part. Right, so they're strong in every direction. So that would be the type of lattice uh, that you would want to do for that. And again, the formula-driven ones um, right here, right? And there's a couple different ones. There's uh, actually three different types. So we can see we have a, a gyroid, we have a kind of a primitive, and then we have kind of a, a diamond-shaped pattern. But I could say, let's use this guy, and they make it half scale and say, put this on our part. So again, that's gonna fill it. But this particular, you notice that it's thicker. It's not beams, it's not real thin walled or thin beam type parts. It's a lot stronger, it's a lot more rigid, and that lends itself really well to uh, supporting uh, the internal structures that, uh, that this would need. Um, and again, not knowing exactly what direction the forces are coming from. Um, you'll notice it also takes a little bit longer to generate this type of information because it is, putting in some uh, solid geometry. I probably should have just made it simple. But uh, we can also calculate the math that's using it, or the representation, so it's low, medium, and high as far as uh, generating um, that geometry. But here we can see uh, that representation here. And again, that's all the way through our, through our part. So I'm gonna close this guy out. And we'll talk about density next. Um, so this is the representation. These are the three different uh, primitives, or I guess lattice uh, cells that we could use for the gyroid the primitive, and then the, the diamond-shaped ones, so we just saw those. Um, one of the things we can also do is vary um, the density of those, not only of the regular beam elements or beam um, lattices that we saw, but also of these formula-driven ones. And then this is a particular example where we know force is going to be exerted on this face. So we want to put more lattice structure there, make it stronger, and then less as it goes farther away where it's not needed. Again, allowing us to print the part faster 
and uh, use less material. So those are the things that we want to have happen. So that was that part that I have here. Kind of a subtlety. Again, I, I'm using just the beam uh, type lattice structure here, but you'll notice that it's a little thicker up here. I'm assuming that there's going to be a force. You know, this part has another part riding on top of it. So I need a little bit stronger here. And then you notice as you get farther and farther away, it gets thinner and thinner. Um, so again, this is a capability that we can certainly control how fast does it get thin and, uh, you know, even is it a linear relationship or not? So there's all kinds of things you can do to, to customize that. But the important thing is uh, we can bring the strength to where you need it. And, and that's kind of really what we wanted to talk about with that. Um, so now is another type of lattice structure called stochastic. So stochastic is a beam-based randomized cell, all right? So it uses beams and they're kind of randomly placed. Uh, they're very good for things um, if you want to maybe uh, have a lattice structure for shock or sound absorption, or even in the medical industry, if you're going to be using this as an implant where you want the bone to grow into that material and kind of um, you know, form in and around it. So it's a good lattice structure for that. Also for uh, thin walled parts. So this would be the random kind of rectangular beam type structure I was using before, but you can see as for a thin walled part, it actually works really well as well, making kind of a foam almost representation inside of that. Um, again, allowing us to still make it really lightweight, but filling it with, uh, with strength uh, so that it can support that. And again, you usually want your thin walled parts to have some strength to them. So there's a couple different uh, algorithms that uh, this uses to create these stochastic lattices. Um, by default, it'll use um, the Voronoi algorithm. And then uh, recently we've added, a, and, and most companies that do uh, lattice generation use the Voronoi uh, algorithm. Uh, but what we've added to ours is uh, the Delnay mathematics to do different uh, type of lattice, same lattice, but different math. So I'm sure we're all familiar with uh, Georgi Vernoy and, and Boris Delaney and their contributions to math. But uh, the thing is, is that um, we have a choice of which type of math to use to generate these type of, uh, these type of elements. So let's take a look at that. Um, Oh, one of the other things I have with this model is uh, it also understands certainly multi-body. So this is a single part that I've kind of cut a section of it out. And I said, that's the part that I want to use um, and have lattices. So we notice we have some stochastic uh, gyroid lattices here, but I'm going to leave the rest of it solid, right? So we can, um, it understands multi-body, right? So we can just pick on a body and say, I just want to put lattice in that body. Um, we can also do it, you know, in regular Creo just by picking volumes and surface and bounds and things like that. But uh, um, this makes it a little bit easier. This multi-body capability in Creo 7 is, is actually a really, really good thing. So let's take a look at this part. And um, one of the things I want to do here is we're going to go to our lattice. And in this case, I'm just going to say for the whole part. And um, we'll use cell type. I'll say is stochastic. So you notice that there's some, I said it was a beam based thing and it, it's still using because it's beams and balls, it's still doing that. So what I have to do is really go over here and turn those guys off, turn the ball off. So here are the beams. And I could say, let's maybe make them a two and maybe half the size. And so I could say, let's, let's put that in first of all. So we'll say, let's take a look at what that. So it's going to replace all the geometry here by this beam infrastructure, right? And you'd obviously do it smaller than this, but I just wanted it to go fast. One of the interesting things you'll notice here is that it lines, it orients and rotates the beams around so they follow the edges of the part, right? So you don't have any gaps or anything. It makes it nice and continuous so you have edges to your part using this type of, uh, this type of structure. Um, so remember just to turn off the ball when you're doing that type of thing. And um, like I said, we can also pop between the two different types of uh, mathematics that are being used in this particular uh, representation. 
So let's go back to our PowerPoint here. Now, all the different types of, you know, we've talked about the regular, you know, beam type lattices. We had formula driven lattices. We have stochastic types of lattices. If none of those work for you, uh, then we can go and use the user defined lattice structure. You can make a .prt and actually a regular part file and use that as your lattice structure. Um, we can also use different surfaces. So it doesn't have to be a solid. Uh, you could use surfaces and what it will do is if it sees a surface, it'll make it thick, it'll thicken it, you know, how thick do you want to make it and it'll turn it into a solid. You can even use curves. If you use curves, it'll make beams. So you'd use curves for maybe doing beam elements and analysis or something like that. And it's also hierarchical. So if you have a solid in your user-defined lattice structure, it will use that and ignore the surface and curves. If you have a surface and curves, it'll ignore the curves and use the surface and make a solid out of that. And then if you just have curves, it'll just create the beams. So that's kind of how that works. Um, let's, uh, let's close this guy out for a second. And let's open up, uh, I should have kept that one guy around here. Um, let's go back to this guy. So, I'm going to go back and show you a user-defined how uh, we bring this. Well, we'll talk a little bit about uh, information. Okay. Now let's pick the, we'll use the same area that we've always been doing. So we'll say this guy, we'll add a shell. And we'll say, let's remove the front face and the back face. So this is what we've been doing so far. And you notice that it's using this type of lattice. Again, I can, from the pull down, grab a different one. I'm going to go down here and say, I want to use a custom one. And it says, well, where is it? So I'm going to open it up. And this is kind of telling you my age. I put Gumby in there, just a random, any shape, right? Something in here, but he's a solid. And I want to use that. So I'm going to fill this void with a bunch of little Gumbies. And um, I'll make them a little bit bigger. It doesn't take too long. We'll say, let's take a look at this. And again, it's kind of crazy what I'm using here, but the idea is, is that we can define our own lattice structure, and then it places that throughout the part. Right. So let's go back to our PowerPoint here. So one of the things when we export this information, usually you think of, okay, we make an STL file, right? That's been around forever. But there's a new export format that can be used called a 3MF. It's sort of like a standard. I would think of it sort of like STEP or IGES or something like that, where um, there's a certain way that you represent the beams or the lattice or different capabilities of this. So what they do with this 3MF export capability is you can export out different materials at the same time, different colors. So lots of different... Um, things other than just a homogeneous type of file. Um, that's what it allows you to do. And the thing is, it's got kind of built-in capability. So just a comparison between the 3MF export and an STL export, um, it's, you know, multiple color capabilities. Um, it allows for, for lattice structures. It, it kind of knows about lattices. And, and I'm thinking also in the future, we'll talk about that in a second. And then um, giving us consistent results. So it, it's it's a good standard um, going forward. One of the things they do is they create what are called extensions. And what it, they do is they break the information up in uh, an exported file into different areas. And then those areas and more extensions will be added as more and more capabilities of 3D printers happen. But you can see that it breaks it down into materials, um, slice extensions. So we can sometimes slice the part before we send it to the printer to check things out to make sure they're good. Um, production extensions, things specifically for lattices and things like that. So as things change, we, they just modify these different extensions to kind of grow with the new capabilities and desires that, uh, you know, that the people want when they start printing uh, 3D parts. Um, one of the other things is uh, a CLI export. This is just getting started now with um, the additive manufacturing. Uh, so right now you can do slices and basically 
in a next release or a maintenance release, um, we'll be able to start viewing the different slices. And that's really the whole idea is we'll say, we wanna create a bunch of slices here. We wanna evaluate each one to make sure that they're fine. And then we'll send that slice information to the printer, assuming that the printer can understand that type of format or that type of slice. Now, some of the printers out there already do slicing, right? You send it to your part, they chop it up, slice it up, and then uh, print it out that way. Again, each slice would represent, you know, one of the passes of the 3D printer as it's uh, creating uh, the particular part. But that's really the extent. I've kind of hit my 30 minute, well, 31 or two minute limit here. So um, one of the things um, I'm going to do is just turn it back to uh, Addison. She can tell you about some of those uh, extensions and uh, new capabilities and sales that we have available for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us on today's webinar. For those of you who are new to the series, I do want to let you know that we have extended our promotion of 50% off eligible Creo extensions. I will be providing a link to this promotion in the follow-up email being sent out later this afternoon. So be sure to watch your email for that. And then also to help organizations through this unknown time, we have ramped up our training team. In the case you are using any PTC system and could benefit from additional training needs, we want you to know our team is here to help. With that being said, for limited time only, we are offering 20% off any training class you take with us as long as you sign up and reference this webinar with the code TRAINING20 within uh, this next week. The offer does end next week on May 27th. Also, um, here is a list of our upcoming webinars in the CREO series. We hope you can join us next week for generative top topology optimization. Another reminder, there will be a short survey I will be sending out in the follow-up email. So please send your answers to us. It does help. Uh, thanks again, everyone. We hope to see you next week and have a great rest of your day.